it's a great honor to receive this uh, prize from the Boris Minster Institute. I've had the pleasure this morning of seeing some of the work that the Boris Mintz Institute is doing, and I feel like it's, it's really inspiring. Uh, Boris Mintz Institute was founded to take on global challenges, and I saw work uh, this morning on, on water issues, uh, work uh, on food security issues, that's, uh, that are in fact uh, is very related to, the, to uh, what I'll be talking about today. Um, the, you know, the involvement of, of Ram Fishman, of the students, I think, is on the ground, really connecting to real-world problems is, is very exciting to see. So you know, BMI is founded to take on global challenges, and one of those challenges is food security. I think one important thing to know is that the challenge of food security is, in fact, a key part of, a, of another challenge, which is the challenge of global poverty. So if you think about the world today, on the one hand, it's characterized by tremendous technological dynamism, globalization, that are offering huge opportunities to many people. On the other hand, it's a world where many people still remain mired in poverty. And particularly, there's almost a billion people, 800 million people, who are still living on, estimated, on under $1 a day. And then many more, of course, who are under $2 a day or under $5 a day. So I think a challenge for us will be, is there a way that to, to try to do something practical, because that's one of the aims of this of Boris Mintz Institute and of this prize, to link research to try to connect the, on the one hand, the huge globalization, the huge technology that we, we now have, and on the other hand, some of the problems of facing these, these, uh, these poorest people in the world. So let me say a little bit more about what's going on. First is some good news, which is although world poverty remains a tremendous problem, it's falling. So the world Millennium Development Goals uh, called for a halving of poverty between 1990 and 2015. And actually, it was cut in half five years ahead of schedule by 2010. So while it's easy to despair about these things, there's actually tremendous progress. You know, where does poverty remain? Well, it's overwhelmingly, more than half of the world's poor are in Africa. Another big area is South Asia. They're mostly in rural areas, and agriculture is a key source of income for them. And if you think about the countries that have really taken off and transformed, accounting for that fall in poverty, obviously China, India, now even African countries are, are growing at quite decent rates. Okay, so there's a real change. But one thing to note is, if you think about China, obviously there's tremendous growth of industry. But one of the key reforms that Deng Xiaoping put in place was reforming agriculture early on. And that allowed a growth of food production, which in turn lifted the living standard of people and also freed up people to be able to move to the cities. India, obviously, is the Green Revolution, and some, some research shows that the areas that the Green Revolution has played an important role in the overall growth of, of India. So what, what can be done about that? Well, I'd like to talk about, at a, you know, at a very practical level, I'd like to talk about some research, um, but that um, this, will, this will be research not only that I've been involved in, but that's taken place uh, by colleagues as well, uh, through something in, uh, called uh, an NGO that I'm involved in called Precision Agriculture for Development. So I wanted to disclose I'm a board member of that, so uh, 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 it's just so you're aware of it. Um, but the research draws on the work of, uh, of many different people, Sean Cole at Harvard Business School, uh, Raisa Fabregas, Dan Bjorkegreen. One person that I'd like to, uh, to mention in particular, because he's here, is uh, Ophir Reich, who's, uh, who's based here in, in Tel Aviv and has been doing a lot of work on data science work, some of which I'll show you uh, uh, in a minute. Okay. Okay. So what's the issue that we're trying to, to address? Just. So there are approximately two billion people around the world who are supported by small farms. Worldwide food demand is growing rapidly. As China and India grow, there's more and more demand for food, for meat, which, which consumes a lot more uh, uh, primary production. There's population growth. 
and there's not very much new land that can be brought into production. So you have to raise output on existing land. But that's difficult in the face of a host of environmental problems, climate change, erosion of soil, acidification of soil. One thing that might hold hope if we want to raise yields is new uh, agricultural technology. And the targeted application of that technology, so using the right type of technology in the right places. And that's progressing to an incredible degree in, in the developed world. So farmers in the U.S., and I imagine in Israel as well, they're using tractors that every few meters they adjust what inputs are being applied to the soil to match the specific needs of that soil. They get data on rainfall, they calculate the amount of moisture in the soil, everything is precisely calculated. What that means is not only do they increase production, there's also environmental benefits because they're not using fertilizer that do where it doesn't need to be used. So that technology is not currently reaching farmers in developing countries. And you can imagine it's not going to be able to reach them through these very expensive tractors. But it's very important to get the agricultural approaches to match the local conditions. So at a, at a basic level, that's the soil conditions, the weather, but it goes beyond that. It's not just soil and weather. You also need to think about the prices. How much, does it cost? How much can you sell your output for? What inputs are available? Um, uh, you know, if you can't buy something, there's no point recommending it. Also, farmer characteristics. You know, more educated farmers might be able to take on certain types of tasks, uh, more complicated production that less educated farmers might not be able to. Does the farmer, can the farmer afford to take on risky new technologies? Well, if they have a source of outside income, if the farmer is, a, is, a, is married to somebody who's earning a regular income every month because they're a civil servant, they can take many more risks than if they're entirely dependent on agriculture for their income. Okay. Um, the problem is that, imp that recommendations, while I said they're very finely targeted in, in developed countries, they're not at all finely targeted in poor countries. Typically, the Government Agricultural Extension Service will recommend a single package for an entire region of a country. And they won't update those recommendations often either. So let me just show from an area, I do a lot of work in Kenya. I'll show the, the consequences of this. So if you look at the top, uh, top left-hand side, that shows the distribution of soil pH. So a big problem is acidification of soils. But that's, and you can see that bar shows the, rec the necessary level according to the Kenyan uh, agriculture authorities. Most farmers don't ha have acidic soil, but some of them don't have acidic soil. So one of the things you do to treat acidic soil is you add lime, and that, that, uh, that restores the pH balance. Well, most, most farmers should be using that, but not every farmer should be using that. If you look at the nitrogen, it's similar. If you look at phosphorus or carbon, similar, similar things. Now, unlike a U.S. farmer who has 2,000 acres and can afford to get soil testing done, the typical Kenyan farmer can't. It costs about $10. And remember, some of these people are living on about a dollar a day. Um, and they, they typically can't afford something like that. And it's not worth it because their farm is maybe a hectare or half a hectare. So they, uh, it won't, they won't repay the cost of, of a test on their own. Let me show you something else, which is there's a lot of spatial correlation of the data. So this is spatial distribution of nitrogen, of carbon. The blue areas, are the, I put the different tercels of the data in different colors. And you can see that there's some patterns. And what that means is that it's useful for a farmer to get information. Ideally, they'd have information on their own farm. But these tests are noisy anyway. So even if they had a test on their own farm, they would take into account the information from their neighbor's farm as well, and their neighbor's neighbor, and so on. And there are statistical techniques that you can use if you have a few data points to predict what uh, what soil chemistry would be like in, in other areas. And, um, and this is, uh, you know, there have been a lot of advances in this. Um, there's also, let me actually, I'll skip ahead a little bit. Well, I'll say this. Um, the, the, so I've mentioned that it's useful for, it would be useful for all of these, no farmer on their own can afford the soil test. 
But collectively, when we, when we calculate the value to each individual farmer, if you add up the value to each farmer of getting soil tests in their, in their local area, in their village, then it's clearly worth it for the village as a whole, even though it's not worth it for any one farmer. So this is a, a classic example of what in economics is known as a public good, something that Ken Arrow was, uh, was, uh, uh, has, has done a lot, of, did a lot of work on. So how do you supply this? Well, this is, I said it's a public good, so that's something where you might expect the government to come in. And in fact, governments in many countries spend a lot of money on providing agricultural advice to farmers. There's over one million agricultural extension workers around the world are in developing countries. The problem is, while this system works very well in some richer countries, in the US, um, I, I think it, it works well here as well, um, it's, it's very problematic in a lot of developing countries. First, it's expensive to send around these, these uh, ex extension workers. They, are, so they do often don't have the transport budget, so they wind up sitting in their offices a lot. They also have pretty weak training. But then let me emphasize the third issue, which is limited accountability. And this is a problem that affects the public sector in many developing countries. There's just, they have a very secure job. There's very weak management systems, very weak systems for monitoring, and very little, you know, they actually often, uh, very little gets done. I was involved in a survey of teachers in India. We just visited schools, and we saw if the teacher was present. Well, they are only present about half the time, for example. So it's even harder to monitor an extension worker who's supposed to be out in the field. They're often by themselves. Nobody, it's very hard to check on, on performance. Okay. So as a result, you know, here are some, only 6% of farmers in India report having talked to an extension worker. 70% of them distrust the, the, the recommendations. So the public sector isn't working very well, but also the private sector isn't working very well. There's a very weak regulatory environment. There's a lot of mom and pop uh, uh, shops selling agricultural inputs, but the, and farmers rely on them for advice. But if you look at the advice that they're giving, they're not giving advice for the, that's best agriculturally. They're giving the advice to, to sell as much product and the highest markup products that they can. Um, so you know, we looked, uh, my uh, collaborator, Sean Cole, looked at uh, a case of a pesticide which is very toxic. It's banned in the US, banned in, in the European Union. It's not even the correct pesticide to use on this particular crop. And there's another pesticide that's safe and that's cheaper and that is the right pesticide. But the agro-dealers are recommending in, uh, this incorrect pesticide because there's a higher markup. And it turns, makes the leaves a sort of brighter green color. So the farmers think it's working, but it's not, in fact, working. So. Um, there are too many problems like that. Surveys in Uganda suggest many of the inputs sold in, in these, uh, by these agro-dealers are, in fact, they claim to have a certain percentage of nitrogen, but it's not, the nitrogen is, that's supposed to be there isn't there. So I think the world now faces an, uh, some opportunities. I'm going to start with the opportunities. There's huge challenges as well. We have to be realistic about that. But let me start with the upside. There's a lot of new technology to help address some of these barriers. So first, there's technology to learn about, uh, about local characteristics. So for example, you used to have to take, take a sample of soil in Kenya, send it off to a distant lab, maybe even Nairobi, to get it analyzed. It was very expensive. Now there are new mobile soil analysis uh, uh, labs that can test this at the site very, very cheaply, hooked up to a smartphone. But you can do even better than that. You can take a satellite picture. You can do a spectroscopic analysis. And there's an amazing amount that you can find out from this. Or you could use drones to take pictures. Weather prediction models are improving tremendously. So you can predict weather at a much more, more fine-grained level and with, uh, with, with greater accuracy and with greater uh, advanced forecasting. So you can collect this information. But not only can you collect it better, but you can send it out to the farmer. You can connect the farmer to the technology and to the information that the world has in a way that was never possible before. Before, you had to rely on an extension worker going around to tell each farmer. Now, even in very poor places, almost all farmers have mobile phones. And that opens up a tremendous opportunity. Why? First, they're very cheap. 
the cost of the co I'm not talking about the phone. The farmer already has the phone. The cost of sending the message to the phone is virtually zero because the cell phone towers in the rural areas, they're already in place, but their capacity is not used. So the marginal cost, the extra cost of sending one more message, it's, it's basically nothing. Far, you know, less, you know, one-tenth of one U.S. cent, or much less than that. Okay. They also can allow um, personalized information. So if you know where the farmer is, and you know what, you can know technologically, you can know what cell phone tower their, farm, their phone is accessing, even if they have a very old style phone with no GPS. If you know where they are, then you can give the right recommendation for that area. What's the weather condition in that area? What's the soil type? Is there a pest outbreak? Okay. You can give it in a timely way. So the agricultural extension agent comes maybe once every five years and say, okay, here's what you do when it's planting time. Here's what you do when you apply the fertilizer. Here's how you store to avoid uh, loss when you're trying to store the crops. The mobile phones can deliver the message at exactly the right time. So when it's planting season, they deliver planting information. When it's harvest season, you deliver information on, on storing the crops uh, effectively or, or saving some of the crop to sell when the prices rise again. Okay. And it also enables two-way communication. One of the char characteristics of effective extension systems is not just that the government decides what messages the farmer needs, but that the farmer provides information on what the farmer's challenges are, and then that feeds back into the research system, up the extension system and into the research system. That process doesn't happen very often in developing countries. There are very strong cultural barriers often to trying to feed, up informa feed information up the bureaucracy. But if you use a mobile phone, you can, get, you can collect some of that information and aggregate it. So that's tremendous, you know, that's some of the, the, the some of the sort of technological, the, the hard science uh, uh, technological potential. But there's also two other areas of advance. The first is the rise of behavioral economics. You know, economists used to model people as completely rational all the time. Well, there's been a huge movement of ideas from psychology into economics. And I think we've learned a lot. And part of what we've learned is ways to, to and into business for that matter, how to craft messages to try to get people to maybe more likely to understand them and to act on them. We've also learned a lot about how to encourage the spread of information. Because not, first of all, not all people have mobile phones, only some of them do. But you can get, we, one of the things we've found is there can be spillover of information and we can do things to en encourage the spillover. And then the last area I'd highlight is data science. Huge advances in understanding very large data sets and using machine learning to, to really tailor advice to the particular characteristics of a farmer and to tailor the nature of the message uh, to, to particular, what's worked on similar farmer, farmers. You can also do, uh, this is something that you know, my field has been involved in, in development economics, but also is very common in the tech world, which is to do A-B tests, or as we call them in development economics, randomized, or in medicine, randomized controlled trials. So, if you're thinking about maybe changing a message a little bit, you could obviously just decide what makes sense to you as the person designing the system um, if you're sending messages to farmers, but you don't really know what's going to be the, the impact of a change. Well, if you're dealing with a, a, and this is some of the work that Ophir has been doing, I'll tell you about later, but you can very rapidly try slightly different messages. You can try changing the system in different ways Half of the sample is randomly selected to get one version. The other half of the sample is randomly selected to get another version. And then you've, you can isolate the impact of one particular factor, and you can measure that impact. And of course, if you have very large samples, you can do more sophisticated things. You can do many different tests. You can see if there's interactions between, well, one message doesn't work well by itself, but if you combine it with another, it does, does better. Those, those do require you know, large data sets, but it's, it's possible to do. So what, what, we're, what, what we're trying to do, and you know, both Sean Cole and I were involved in research of this type, and we decided to join forces, and we founded a, a nonprofit organization, an NGO, to, to try to advance this, was to try to get more two-way flow of information. So collect information on the farmer characteristics. Uh, you have to do that at the right time, as I'll discuss. Get the input recommendations communicate to the farmer, and depending on the, the context, that might be through an SMS, it might be through IVR, 
uh, interactive voice response systems in which the farmer hears a recorded voice saying, if you're interested in this type of information, press 1. If you're interested in that type of information, press 2. Or if you're interested in this type of information, you know, say this word. Um, um, and eventually, as smartphones spread, it'll, you'll, we'll be using apps. But right now, most farmers in poor countries don't have smartphones. We then use A-B tests, machine learning, insights from behavioral economics to try to refine the, the messages and to test the refinements. We get farmer ratings. Uh, depending on the, the context, we ask them questions to see if they've understood it. Feedback mechanisms are very important. And then we feed that back into redesign and, and keep this loop going. Um, so some of, the ty some of the information, as I said, is on, is on the farm characteristics. Some of it's on the characteristics of the, the farmer. And some of it's, uh, and then putting that together, you can give this customized advice. It's a key principle that we've been trying to fo follow is to work at scale. Why? Because if you really want to learn and test, if you want to, if you want to do you know, piloting is very important in small samples to really understand the community you're working in. So this is not against piloting. We're entirely in favor of piloting. That's the first and a very essential step. But once we've got some pilots and we have some sense of what might work, then there's nothing like actually testing it out. So we test it out, and if you can test it on a large sample, you can pick up, uh, you can isolate the impact of small changes and then keep, uh, keep adjusting based on that. But you really need, often need very large samples for this. And we'd like to do this in multiple geographies so that we can take insights from one area and apply it to other areas. Okay. Okay. Okay, let me, um, so we try, to, you know, we try to measure, in terms of measuring our impact, you know, we try obviously to measure the number of farmers we've reached, the farmer satisfaction, do they even keep listening, some very basic things like that. Uh, um, do they call back? Do they want more information? We also try to look at behavior change. Do they change the inputs that they're using, for example? We can often get data on that. Can we get, do, we, do they change their practices? Okay, what, if we have that, and if we have data, agricultural data on the impact of changing practices and inputs on yield, we can estimate the impact on yield. Now, in some cases, we can actually measure the impact on yields or, or the change in income. That, um, let me give you some results from India. This is from results from uh, Sean Cole and Nilesh Fernando. Uh, this wasn't uh, actually my work. Um, what we find is they did, a, they did a service. It was actually a fairly intense service. Most of my work's in Africa. We've been doing SMS messages. It's, it's much more low touch, uh, um, uh, just a limited number of SMS messages. They've do, been doing a, a regular uh, 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 interactive voice response program that has messages on a wide variety of different types of content. They found that the farmers were willing to pay about $2 for a six-month subscription. It costs about $20 to provide the service that they were providing. But the estimated effect on profitability was about $215 per farmer per year. And again, these are very poor farmers, so you know, relative to their incomes, this is a substantial gain. But one thing you'll note from this is that although it's a tremendous, you know, huge benefit cost ratio, sort of a 10 to 1 benefit cost ratio, it's going to be hard to sustain this as a business model given the willingness of farmers to pay for this. So farmers, you know, why are farmers not willing to pay more? Well, you know, maybe they don't have the cash. Um, maybe there, there are various behavioral uh, uh, issues. Maybe they don't fully realize how valuable the advice is for them. But there's also a fundamental problem with markets for information. Again, one that's been highlighted by Ken Arrow, which is if I'm selling information, it's very hard, it's very hard often to, to get the full value of that information because you know, if I sell the information to you and then I go to your neighbor and say, pay me for the information, you'll say, why should I pay you? I'll just ask my neighbor. And you know, there, this information flow means that it's very hard to run this as a profitable business. I don't want to say it's impossible, but in this particular case, it probably wouldn't have been possible. Other contexts we've looked at, it probably isn't, isn't possible. So I think there are a number of organizations that have tried this, and generally they're not having a lot of success where business, with business models where they ask them to pay a certain amount each year. But the social value of this is huge, 
And this is something that the public sector is already spending when they hire those million extension agents, they're already spending a lot on. So I think we need to look for other, you know, other business models for this. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, some more about that. Okay. Um, let me skip this. Um, okay. Let me, let me say a, a bit about, you know, I told you some of the evidence from India, but let me say a little bit of the evidence from other contexts. So we've now done, I think, eight different trials around the world of, of mobile phones, uh, get delivering message to farmers via mobile phones to try and see if it can work. And what we found was, I think six of them, we found positive effects. Two of them, we did not find much effects. All of these were done as randomized trials. So we have a treatment group, a comparison group. We can isolate the impact of the mobile phone message. Okay. So, what we've, so let me tell you about some of the results, but I'll also tell you about some of the ones that didn't work. Okay. So we've done a lot of, a lot of work in Kenya to first just see, will farmers change their behavior in response to mobile phone messages? A lot of that was around this problem of soil acidity uh, that can be very, actually quite inexpensively addressed by adding lime. Lime's a new input to this area. Farmers didn't know much about it. And what we found was when we sent SMS messages to farmers in areas where they should use more lime, they were more likely to use the lime. When we sent SMS messages saying, in your area, you actually don't need it, we saw a reduction in lime use. Okay? I on farmer yields, I told you the results on, uh, on, uh, from India. In Kenya, we did work with sugarcane farmers. We can work with sugarcane farmers, sell their output to the sugarcane factory, so we, can, we get measure, very precise measurement of the yield. And what we found was that they got 8 to 12 percent increases in yields uh, with access to an SMS-based uh, information and reminder system. And we tailored that to the planting date. Sugar is a crop that you, you, different farmers are plant that at different times because you have to keep the factory operating year-round, so you need harvesting going year-round. So they can't necessarily, they don't automatically hear from each other, but the SMS message can be timed uh, to, the, to when they're harvesting. Or, or to, sorry, to the right time in the agricultural season. Okay. Um, I already mentioned this, uh, this cotton trial in, in India. But one pattern we're finding, so when we, when we heard, uh, this is something that, that uh, Ron Fishman's work also suggests, that governments often get these things wrong. And it's not necessarily for the reasons that we, you know, we think of governments as being corrupt, and particularly in the developing world as being corrupt and, and so on. It wasn't corruption. It was just the people writing these messages have PhDs in agriculture, or at least master's degrees. The way they think about things is very different than the way the farmer thinks. So, for example, in Kenya, you know, one of, what, one of the trials where we saw no impact was of the Kenyan government messages. And those messages, you know, I mean, this is an extreme example, but they said if your soil pH is less than 5.5, you know, apply lime. Well, the farmers don't know what pH is. They don't, certainly don't know what the pH of their soil is. It's very hard if you use a message that's so disconnected from the realities of the farmer to expect anything. And uh, you know, one of the things that I saw today was when the students presented is they're spending time on the ground in India with the farmers. And that's going to be essential to try to, 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 to have any hope of uh, making progress here. But it's not just you know, the Kenyan government. This is a pervasive uh, problem. So we looked at the Indian government and the government of Pakistan have both done, invested very heavily in analyzing soil chemistry. And then they're delivering cards with that information to the farmers. Well, what Ram's work shows, what Sean's work shows, is farmers, they could not understand the soil health card. It was very, very difficult to under, for them to understand. So one of the things that we've done as, a, as an NGO is we've worked to help redesign the soil health card to make it easier to understand. But we've also worked to to try to develop a mobile phone system so that one hour after the farmer gets the soil health card, they get a phone call, and the phone call gives them a personalized walkthrough of exactly what's in their soil health card, personalized to the content of, you know, to their particular soil chemistry. Okay. And I do want to say, you know, it's very easy if you work in development to get very cynical about governments. But you know, let me give you the example of Pakistan. There was huge political pressure. There was an election coming up. 
There was huge political, they'd already printed 500,000 of these soil health cards. They were going to roll them out. Actually, once we told them some of these results, they actually changed their mind. They delayed the implementation. They, 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 we, they, we worked with them to design, design new soil health cards uh, to set up the, the, the mobile system. And there, you know, they decided, OK, we'll, we'll tell the politicians that we have to, have to wait and, and do this better. And in India, we've also had a, a very positive response. And uh, the government, so in, in Pakistan, we're working with Punjab state. In India, we're working with the state of Odisha. These states in South Asia are you know, the size of, of European countries, or, or in some cases, larger than that. Um, and, um, and I think there'll be a lot of receptiveness in other Indian states as well. Right now, our issue is just our capacity to, to, uh, you know, to, to handle all of the, the work. So there's really been, I'll tell you about an experience in this uh, large African country. This is something that Ophir has been working on. Uh, let me show you some of the, the data from that. Okay. Um, first, let me say a little bit about, I've talked about you know, testing the messages, but there's actually a lot that you can do just with the data from the, from the system. And some of these things are you know, deep, deep, on deep points that might shed light on broader theories. Some of them are extremely applied. Um, you know, does playing a jingle at the beginning of the message, does that help or does that hurt? Um, um, the, you know, it takes a, a fair amount of, uh, of work to do this, but there's sometimes things you can see that are actually, let me, sorry, let me skip uh, uh, a bit to s show you, uh, since I promised it, uh, some of the work of, um, that, um, that Ophir has been doing. So we worked with a, a large African country that actually put in place a system, they were the first large-scale system in Africa to give advice to farmers through mobile phones, through, mostly through interactive voice response. Three million callers have called in, they advertise it on the radio. We complemented, so we collected quantitative data from the system itself. It's very low cost, it's basically free because it's already there, it just has to be analyzed. But we complemented that with qualitative data collection where we sent people out into the field to talk to farmers and get ideas from that. And then the next step was to do a series of A-B tests and to, get, to find out whether some of the ideas that we got from analysis of the basic data could actually improve things. So let me walk you through some of that process. I'll come back to this graph in a minute. Okay. So the, the, the first graph on the left, I realize you won't be able to read that, but that shows farmer acquisition. So you're getting farmers to join the system. So you can see there are these peaks. Those co coincide with the radio campaigns. So a bunch of farmers join the system after that. But what you'll see is they don't stay in the system. They're not retained. So if you look at farmer retention, you see that going way down over time. It's a peak, and then it goes down. Next time there's a radio campaign, it goes back, and it comes down. Overall, the system's growing the number of users, but they lose most of these users who join at each radio campaign. Why is that? Well, here's a chart that Ophir put together on the user interface. And you can see, the f well, you probably can't see because it's too small, but you can see the broad pattern of this. And I'll tell you a little bit uh, of the rest since I guess if I have to look over here to, to read the screen. Apologies for that. Uh, but do they get past the first message? They, uh, well, most people get past the first message. Then they have to say what language uh, do they want it in because there are multiple languages in this, in this country. Uh, they have to go through a long profile registration system in which they say, are they an irrigated land? Are they rain-fed land? Are they male? Are they female? You can see people are dropping off throughout this process, okay? Because they don't have, for I think, two reasons. One is they don't have the patience to go through this long menu, and the other is they may not be able to follow everything in the menu, okay? So when you get down to do they actually get content, you know, it's actually a much smaller number of the farmer than the farmers who call in. Here's another clue that something serious has gone very seriously wrong. So you call in and it says, you know, press one if you want information on pr uh, preparing for planting. Press two if you want planting information. Press three if you want fertilizer application in the middle of the season. You know, press four for information on post-harvest storage, etc. Here's the seasonality in that. Not very much seasonality. People are pressing are not asking for information that's related to the time of the agricultural season. That's pretty suspicious. Let me go back to the, the, the slide that I saw before, I showed before. This shows the, 
the, what, the asking for pre-planting information, that's the first option. On the, the blue line is on the interactive voice response. The green line is showing calls into the help desk. You'll see in the help desk, it does follow the seasonal pattern that you would expect. But for the interactive voice system, it's not. Why is that? Basically, people are pressing one. The overwhelming majority of answers are always going to be one. So people don't know how to use the system, and they're pressing one every time. Okay? I don't think, I don't think this, so I gave some examples earlier where we got very positive results out of this. Here's a case where the, go, the, the government has taken this program to reach three million users, and some people are benefiting from it. You know, some people are able to get through the system, they keep calling back over and over and over again, there is a subpopulation like that. But it's not benefiting most farmers, it's not even benefiting, you know, it's not even benefiting, uh, it's a small, very small percentage of the country that are, are benefiting from this. And that's in part because of issues with system design. So you could just throw up your hands and say, oh, this is just not going to work. But that's not the approach that, uh, that Ophir and that the others working on this project took. They said, what concrete suggestions can we come up uh, from this? So I uh, wish I had some of those. Uh, let's see if I can find the slides for that. No, I, I, I don't see the slides, unfortunately. But let me just tell you some of the examples. Or maybe, uh, maybe so oh, it's further down. OK, I, I switched this. I, I modified some of the slides. So I'll just, I'll just, I'll just say some of them. So one thing is, what if you change the, the profile registration? So instead of asking the people all these questions up front, what if you put that later? Well, if you think about it, if you use, I use Waze, OK? When I first started using Waze, it did not ask me, do I prefer the, the, short, the fastest route or do I prefer the one with tolls? Do I prefer the, one, the fastest route or do I prefer one that doesn't involve lots of turns? It just started immediately giving me advice. Why? Because it knew very consistent with results from, from behavioral economics. People are very impatient. They want to benefit right away. And if they don't give the benefit right away, they're going to give up on it. Now later, after I'd been using it for six months, and I could see that it was very useful, then it started asking me some of these questions. So imagine you, do, you just delay the registration. Well, only about 50% of people are actually accessing useful agricultural content on this, this big government system. So what Ophir did, together with his Ethiopian colleagues, was they tried, and by the way, this is an, another example of, of, how, of the openness that I, that I referred to. You know, when they, they were very proud of the system. You could imagine that when a report was given to them showing all the problems with them, that they would have said, you know, it would have been defensive. It's a natural human reaction. Instead, they were very open, and they said, let's test and find out what works. So one of the ideas was to do this, uh, was to do this, um, um, to delay the profile registration. That took the percentage of people who are actually accessing content from 50% to 60%, okay? Now you might say 60% is not good enough, but that's one change. And the aim would be to do a whole series of change, to put training messages, training on the system at the beginning so you hear that first. Here's another thing that, that was done. Sounds, you know, very, very simple. If you didn't press any number, after 10 seconds, the system would hang up. Well, now they're doing experiments where after four seconds, it repeats the, the menu to you, so you get another chance at using it. Okay, these are very basic ideas, but cumulatively, they can have a big impact. And you know, the government's adopting these, uh, and it's, it's reaching millions of, of farmers. Um, OK. So, you know, this is one example of a, of a partnership. Um, sorry, let me see if I can. Okay. Let me say uh, um, you know, another example of what we're doing in India. So we started out with our own service with r roughly 50,000 farmers in Gujarat. And we did that as a, as a lab where we could experiment. We found, th those were some of the results I showed you earlier. But the government of, of ERISA has, and uh, the International Rice Research Institute has asked us to collaborate on a, on a similar system designed to reach 2 million farmers. We're also working with the private sector, with IFCO Kassan, that has 1.7 million farmers. They're an ag uh, agricultural input supplier. Um, we're working with Agristar um, on this. And a lot of this work is done in collaboration uh, with JPAL. Um, um, and the... Um, so, 
yeah, so and uh, this, this, the right-hand side shows some of the, the elements of this. We get, people get push calls. There's opportunities for them to ask questions on topics they want to. They can share their experience with other farmers. Um, we keep records on what each farmer has done. They can forward things to friends. And we get feedback from them on how useful they think each message was. And that allows us to continually learn. So the first, you know, the first product was not very good. But over time, you can get better and better. But you need, a, you need large samples to do that. So in Kenya, that's an area where most of, most of my work is, we d initially did pilots on the, the soil fertility and, and some pest issues. We're now working with One Acre Fund, which is an NGO that reaches 300,000 farmers. And they, in Kenya, and then uh, another, another 600,000 around the world, they, have, they sell inputs to farmers. So we get very good data on what inputs they're using. And then we can use that to see what messages are most effective. So they did, we did a small test with them, and then based on the results of that test, they scaled this up to all of their farmers in Kenya and in Rwanda, so we're reaching uh, uh, 400,000, 500,000 farmers through that. But then we also talked to the Ministry of Agriculture. Kenya is currently facing, a, an in, not just Kenya, Africa is facing the invasion of a, a pest that affects maize, which is the most important crop in much of Africa, particularly southern and eastern Africa. There was a, 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 a pest that had been in the Americas, had never been in Africa before, but crossed uh, presumably from Latin America initially to West Africa, and then ra rapidly spread uh, throughout, throughout the continent. Uh, so it's, a, it's only a year or two of experience with it, but it's, it can be devastating to, to maize and to sorghum and some other crops. It's called fall armyworm. You know, this was, as I was saying to somebody at lunch, you know, this was front page news on the, on the national newspaper. I mean, not when it happened. It was front page news. You know, I happened to be in Kenya a few weeks ago. It was front page news then. People are very concerned about it. The permanent secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture said, you know, asked for our advice on it. And we suggested they contact the telephone company and ask the telephone company to send out messages on this. Well, this telephone company is, you know, very profitable. They have a, a very strong market position. They're regulated by the government. When the country is facing a national emergency and they get asked to do something, obviously they want the, the good public relations that comes from it, especially since it costs them virtually nothing to send out some additional SMS messages. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of work on you have to get legal permissions from the communications authority to send unsolicited messages, all sorts of, <coughs> of issues. But basically, Kenya is now planning to send almost every, every cell phone subscriber in the country messages about fall armyworm. And then, then they can request if they want additional information. And not just on fall armyworm, but more generally on agriculture. So we'll soon be, you know, we'll be sending messages to, to millions of people in Kenya. And we expect, you know, a minimum hundreds of thousands of them to sign up for, for additional information. Uh, in Rwanda, we're, we're working with, currently working with One Acre Fund and reaching uh, 200,000 clients there, um, or at least those of them who have mobile phones. But we're also giving messages, and this is something that uh, you know, we're set up as a nonprofit. If you're a profit-maximizing organization, you wouldn't want the farmers that you send messages to tell the other farmers uh, the results. But from a nonprofit point of view or from a government point of view, you definitely want to encourage that. So we're experimenting with different ways of, of encouraging that with some very encouraging results on spillover of these messages. Okay, in Pakistan, um, we're also trying to support, um, do mobile phone ag extension. And this is, when I say 5 million farmers, it's obviously maybe five times as many people who are supported because you know, for every farm, there's a, really I should say 5 million farm families. Um, Okay, and we're working with uh, partners in Pakistan on that. Oh, went backwards. Okay, sorry. Okay. There's a number of new programs that are, are on the horizon, uh, working uh, with coffee farmers in Uganda, uh, with coffee in India, uh, working with uh, uh, CIMIT, which is part of the international network of, of research institutions and uh, on, uh, on local, local seed varieties and training training the agri-dealers in this. So right now, so far, we focus mainly on farmers. But I think part of what we want to do is train the extension agents. So it's partly a matter of training them, giving them better information. But eventually, you cannot just be training extension agents, but you could be using this for better accountability. The, the extension, the farmers just have an old, old style phone. The extension workers typically will have a smartphone. That'll have a GPS system in it. You can see, did the 
Who are they supposed to visit each, each day? Did they actually go to the field? Maybe they could get the phone number of the farmer they interact with. Then you could call that farmer and say, did so-and-so visit? What did they tell you? Did they do a good job? You could improve accountability of extension workers tremendously, potentially. There's also the other group that we can work with where farmers get agricultural information is agri-dealers at shops. So right now, those guys are often not informed, and they often have incentives to give bad information. But you could imagine giving those guys some training. Imagine they could get videos on their smartphone to explain how to use certain, certain agricultural crop, uh, inputs, uh, chemicals of, of various types. Well, that might be a draw to get, bring more customers into the shop. Some of them might decide they want to pursue a very different strategy. Instead of going for the short-run sales on the most profitable item, maybe they'll try and develop a reputation for giving quality advice. If they have the information to do that, you know, maybe some of them will do that. You could also imagine doing Yelp-like reviews, so farmers could say that these shops are, are, are giving good advice, these ones aren't, these ones are selling adulterated inputs, these other ones aren't. So those are things that you know, we've got some leads on. Um, we hope that we'll be able to reach 50,000 uh, extension agents in, in, uh, in Ethiopia soon, and we have at least preliminary conversations about reaching uh, all of Rwanda's extension agents as well. Okay, let me. Um, we've, our, you know, our, our aim, which we said a while ago, was to try and reach 20, uh, to, by, to come down to, have our costs come down a lot, and to get to 5 million farmers in scale by 2020. And we're, we're definitely on track to doing that. In fact, you know, I've just, I, you know, if I, if I just, just some of the, the ones that I've told you about here, you know, in Kenya, I think we'll be definitely be reaching a million farmers. In Ethiopia, two and a half million. In Pakistan, three million. In, it, in just one state in India, one million. So you can see that I think we're very likely to, to exceed this goal. And of course, you know, that's five, mo five times as many people if you count the family members as well. So our approach, I mentioned how there are a number of organizations, typically very small scale, working on a subscription model. Our approach is to work with large scale partners. So sometimes that's governments, sometimes that's NGOs like One Acre Fund that have a lot of reach. Um, sometimes that's, that's companies like a sugarcane company or like a network of dairy cooperatives. They'll have a lot of, uh, a lot of farmers. We want, we're seeking, uh, uh, typically we know we're going to have to put in money to get this relationship going, especially at the beginning, because, you know, right now, um, they're not used to, to dealing with us, and, and we're trying to learn from this and establish a uh, proof of concept. Once we start working with them, if they have a lot of farmers, we can do very rapid refinement and local adaptation. But we, we're trying to get, in, from each, increasingly as we go forward, we'll try and get at least some of the, the, the costs covered by the local partner. And that's happening. You know, in, in Ethiopia, the government's paying for all the cell phone calls. They're also linking us with their donors, like the Gates Foundation. Um, in, in, uh, in, in Odisha, they've, they've, uh, the government's linked us with the Gates Foundation, which is providing support to them. Um, so, um, so if we can cover at least some of the costs that way, then we think that we can cover some of the rest of the costs, either with you know, some of the things we're doing are public goods, uh, some of the stuff to try and get learning, to try and get results on what works and publish that, and we can get donor support for that. Some of the things, we, there may be opportunities to get for revenue models. As we get, you know, there might be some cases where subscription works, there may be advertising models, uh, there may also be, be cases where we can do input uh, aggregation. We can collect orders from multiple farmers and that can make it profitable to supply inputs. Um, so that's the long run vision, but, but right now, of course, we're in the R&D phase. And, you know, just as tech companies, you know, they try to get to scale, a Facebook or so on, they, they, they're able to use funds from investors to get to scale. And once they get to scale, then they can figure out how to, to monetize it. You know, we're really in this, this situation where we're, we're now bringing in, in revenue and we're getting some customers who, you know, we think are, are you know, very important long-term customers. But we're still really very much in the, in the, in the scaling phase. Okay. Um, going the wrong direction here. Um, one thing I wanted to, to conclude with is just talking about opportunities for collaboration. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I was very honored to get this Barsman Institute Prize and very excited to talk about this here 
I'd be, also be happy to talk about other work that I've done, is because uh, Barsman's Institutes and, and Institute in Tel Aviv more generally, and Israel more generally, have strengths in some of the areas that are really core to our work. So strengths in agriculture, strengths in IT, um, you know, we've benefited a lot from Ophir, as I've said, and strengths in economics and behavioral science. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll emphasize that because if you just take any one of these areas, you know, the, the people designing these agricultural messages that went awry, they were very competent in, in agriculture, but they didn't have the insights from behavioral science about how best to communicate with farmers. Similarly, you know, IT is really fundamental to what we do. So really what we need to do is bring together people from all of these fields uh, to work together. And you know, if there are people here who are working in any of these sectors and are interested in, in talking, you know, let us know. Because right now we're in a situation where we have, have more large institutions that are interested in working with us than we have capacity to deal with. And we would love to, uh, we'd love to, to work with other people in, in collaborating on this. So thank you. Happy to take any questions or if you uh, any anyone um, add any corrections? Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, I should say I don't know whether uh, this is uh, Itai and I have had some uh, conversations about the opportunity to collaborate, and you know I'm very grateful to him for hosting me, and I, I hope we'll be able to uh, to collaborate further in the in the future. But um, would love to to discuss any of these issues or broader issues in economics of developing countries. Okay, yes. To give up what? To give data. To give data, yes, yes. Right. Um, so uh, that's a, it's a great topic and great question. To some extent, let me say a little bit about what part of our vision on this is. If you think about Netflix, if I use Netflix, uh, a movie service, I say afterwards, they say, rate the movie. How much did you like it? Well, I have incentives to truthfully answer that question because if I answer that question, I'll, they'll give me better recommendations in the future for things I'll like. But when I give that data, I'm not just helping myself, I'm helping them better forecast what other movies, people who have similar profiles to me, will like. And then that, that allows them to serve other people better. And that's one of the reasons why there's economies of scale in this, in this sector. So that's part of what we're doing. Let me tell you two, uh, two specific areas. One where we've got some evidence, the other, we don't have evidence yet, but I'm optimistic. So one was we worked with this large sugarcane factory and we worked with the farmers. Now the sugarcane factory, so contract farming is becoming more and more common in the developing world. The sugarcane factory supplies input, supplies fertilizer, supplies seed to the farmers. They lend them the money for this and then when they harvest, they, they pay the farmer but they deduct the cost of the loan to buy all of the inputs. Now the problem is, this, they were not deliver, sometimes they didn't deliver the fertilizer at all Sometimes they delivered it late. If you deliver the fertilizer late, that's very bad for output. So the farmer's taking out a loan to pay for the fertilizer. They get it after the optimal time for application. That's a disaster for them. Before, before we started working with them, they, this sugarcane factory covers a very large area. So the farmers would have to go all the way to the, to the, to the factory location, complain to somebody, who would then complain to their boss, who would pass it up, who would pass it up, who would pass it up, who would then go over to a different department and tell them, okay, the fertilizer hasn't arrived. Well, that process wouldn't necessarily work and it was also very expensive and time consuming. What they can do after the program was instituted, they could call into a hotline and they could say if their fertilizer delivery was late. We saw a big reduction in late fertilizer deliveries, but to connect up to your question, 
that didn't just benefit them. It benefited all the farmers in their area. Because if one far farmer wasn't getting fertilizer on time, then probably the neighboring farmers wouldn't. So that's a case where the farmer was reporting something because it served their own interest. But by doing that, they helped the other farmers in the area. And then the other example, and this we haven't, you know, this is hypothetical so far, but this new, this new pest, fall armyworm. Well, we're hoping that farmers, once we send out these SMS messages, we'll ask them to report uh, uh, if they have pests in the field. We're hoping that they will report this accurately. Now, they have incentives to report it accurately. You can recognize fall armyworm and distinguish it from other pests, okay? And we, we, but the farmer should have incentives to accurately report what they see in the field, because if so, then they'll get better advice on what to do with it, if we know if it's fall armyworm or if we know it's something else. So, some data I think we can collect for free on this principle that people will report it because, accurately because it will benefit them. But there will be other cases where that might be more difficult and maybe we will need to think about actually paying farmers for the information in some way. Yes? Um, so I think we're, we're interested in working, you know, both with individuals who, are, who, are, who have, uh, have, you know, these skills in, in terms of, you know, we're looking to expand our, our team with them. Um, but we're potentially interested in working with, you know, partnering with companies as well. I focused a lot on collaborations with governments, but, you know, we're also collaborating with some companies. For example, there's a, in Ecuador, there's a big palm oil company that we're working with. In, in India, I mentioned a few, couple of companies that we're working with there. The sugar company, that was a private company. So, yes, if there are, if there are companies that are interested, you know, also, we'd be happy to talk to them. Okay. I own a company called CIG. Okay. I work in India, okay. Latin America, and uh, Africa. Okay, wonderful. I just came a few days ago from India. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Great. Well, I'd love to talk uh, afterwards about that. And uh, um, one, one thing I, let me mention one sort of broader issue. So there's, it's, I think you're completely right, and I do want to be realistic about this. You know, a mobile phone message can only go so far. So there'll be, some farmers will react, but there'll be lots of other farmers who are just not, you know, you could give them all the information in the world, they're not going to change their behavior. So what, one of the things that we're relying on is, you can, the, one of the advantages of this mobile phone-based system is you can reach millions of farmers, tens of millions of farmers very cheaply. But you're not going to be getting the, you know, the doubling of yield or that sort of thing that you could get from a more intensive system. So I think some places, one of the things we're very interested in with One Acre Fund is they actually do a very intensive uh, work with farmers. They don't actually control literally the inputs, but they, they, have, a, spend a, they have a lot of personal face-to-face -face interaction. And we thought just adding a mobile phone message to that would not do very much because they already have the face. We found some incremental gain from that, but I totally agree that you know, if you can get a much, a much higher touch system like it sounds like you have, you'll be able to get bigger, you know, much bigger percentage gains. The community. What is the, reason? Uh, the community. Okay, well, let's, let's talk afterwards. I'd love to learn more. Uh, yes? Yeah, I'm Adam. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think that's going to depend on the, the context, but one way is just SMS, they SMS backwards. Um, and I should say, you know, some of the two-way stuff, we're doing some stuff, some of that's, you know, more aspirational. But on the, also in the IVR system, for example, just the message, the radiance, did you think this message was useful, you know, press this, did you, th you know, and so on. So just that type of, of, of information will be useful. In the future, you know, there's, 
there's technology out there so you can actually take a picture of the pests in your field and then get it, have machine learning algorithms uh, try and identify that. So if farmers have smartphones, then you'll be able to do that. Most of the farmers we're dealing with now don't have them, but you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, most of them probably will. Um, other things that you can, you can uh, you know, well, there's, there's, so I think there's some things you can do now, more things you'll be able to do with, with better technology. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, 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 yeah. That's right. Let me pick up on what you said about jumping ahead in technology and these somewhat more intensive ap approaches. I think there's a role both for these more intensive approaches and for these very broad scale approaches that are, are lighter touch. So I think where, where is best suited for each? Well, if you have a high value crop and if you have relatively advanced farmers, let's say you're working with you know, you're working with horticulture or you're working with dairy. Uh, those are things where you might be able to go for some of these more more, you know, things that involve sensors that are a little bit more costly than just an SMS message. Um, and if you've got advanced farmers who are used to adopting new techniques or maybe a little bit more educated, then you'll also have more success with that. At the same time, there are a lot of farmers who are just, you know, growing staple crops, growing maize or rice or wheat, have a tiny amount of this, and it's probably going to be a while before most of those farmers can be served with these more advanced technologies. So for those people, we're looking for things that can be adopted, you know, inputs that, some chemical inputs, for example, that ideally would be part of a package, um, but even if, you know, hybrid seeds and fertilizer and irrigation, but it, maybe even with some parts of that package are useful on their own. And then hopefully we can get people on a cycle. And not, I wouldn't just say hopefully. You know, we've done these randomized controlled trials, so we know eight, eight of them. So we've got evidence from multiple contexts that this can have an impact if done right. And then we're also going to be doing this at very large scale. So if you, if you pick up, you know, just a few percentage points in gain for something that costs pennies to send or less than pennies to send, I mean, the, the full-scale program in India costs, I said cost $20, that was early stage, but most of what we're doing in Kenya costs pennies to send, um, um, then, you know, you can get some gains uh, uh, for each, both for the intensive market, the smaller intensive market, and for this very broad market. Yes. Yeah. Right. No, okay, great. No, thanks very much. So we're doing a little bit on USSD, but mainly we're using SMS and, and IBR, but maybe we should be doing more on, on, on USSD. Um, the, on, on the, uh, even SMS is trivially, it's very inexpensive for, uh, for a, you know, for a provider uh, to do it. On the, Issue of finance, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, so far we have, so haven't been working so much in finance, but I think there are some important opportunities there as well. So I'll just give you an example. You know, a, lot, a very big source of, of finance in, in most businesses is credit from suppliers. And that's true in agriculture as well. 
if you think about what so if, if you go to these shops, these agro dealers, you know, they have a book with all the loans they've made to farmers. And they give loans informally. This is not formal, but they just they know what they know which farmers they think, okay, I can trust this person, I'll give them some credit. And they keep it in their book. But it's not kept anywhere else. Okay, and that does get credit out to some farmers. But there are other but it's very limited. Only some farmers get credit, other farmers don't. Probably you don't want to trust somebody with too much money because what are you going to do if they don't repay you? You're certainly not going to take them to court. You know, uh, you might try and shame them in the village or something like that. Okay? Well, imagine that you had a system where you had agri-dealers sign up and you could tell the agri-dealers when your customer signs up, put them on our system, we'll send them advice about agriculture. And now that we're going to send them advice, we're going to tell them let me not even start with credit. Credit's one of the harder things. We'll send, the, we'll send you information on what, what, we'll keep track of what they bought last year, and we'll send information on what was recommended this year. And when you get the product in stock, you know, send us a message and we'll let them know, you know, it's free advertising. We'll let them know you have it in stock, what the price is, et cetera. Well, among other things, you might get competition on price among all these agri-dealers, because, you know, the farmer may have to walk, you know, two hours to the agri-dealer. Once they get there, they're not going to be able to compare the price to, to another, another agro-dealer. So you get more, more price competition, maybe get some improvement in the sector that way. But the other thing that you could offer these agro-dealers is you could say, if you're making a loan, and obviously lots of regulatory issues, we haven't started to look into this. I could imagine this not being a good idea. But one thing we'd like to explore is, if you give a loan to a farmer, let's have sort of a credit bureau type uh, situation, where if the farmer doesn't repay you, then you can put them on the system and warn them, warn people that they have bad credit. And then they don't just, that has two positive effects. First, once that system's in place, farm agri-dealers may be much more willing to give credit because they know who's a good risk and who's not. Second, if you do borrow as a farmer, you have stronger incentives to pay back because you want to keep your credit score high. So the same sort of, you know, system of credit scoring that helps exists in developing countries, in developed countries, you know, we could try to put that in place for farmers in, in, uh, in, in developing countries. So that's one of the things that at least potentially we'd love to look at. We haven't done a, you know, I've given, I can give you a long list of things we'd love to do, but we, ha we haven't done it yet, but we hope to eventually. Yeah. No, I think trust is a really important issue. And, you know, just like we get a lot of spam email, I don't know, maybe in Israel people get spam phone calls as well. I'm getting them more in the U.S. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of spam SMS and, 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 and you know, and people who are, who are con men who are, you know, trying to cheat people out of their money. So people are, are concerned about that. So I think there's several things. You, and we actually did one trial. It was a long code SMS versus short. And we saw that was some evidence that trust matters. People reacted differently to them. So there's various things you can do on trust. One is, one of the reasons why we tend to cooperate, we don't, you know, we do a little bit on our own. But mostly we work through partners. Because if you get a message that came from Mumia Sugar Company or from One Acre Fund, you know, you know who you're dealing with. And even, even the government, you know, the government may not have that much trust, but, you know, people might trust them more than just a random thing. Okay? Or the telephone company. You know, you might get a message from Safaricom, that's the main telephone company in, in Kenya. Um, another element of this is to combine this with other media. So if you have a radio campaign at the same time, then people are much more likely, or if, the, if you're sending out message through, I'd love, to, you know, the long-run vision would be to integrate this with the extension workers and with the agri-dealers. Then you, your local extension worker says, here, sign up here. If you sign up, you're going to start getting these phone messages. Then you're expecting it. You're much more likely to pay attention. Or similarly, your agri-dealer, if you've been a customer for a while and you're, they tell you face-to-face -to, -face to do it, you're much more likely to take it. And then finally, viral marketing. So you could get your friends you know, to sign up other people. So those are three techniques. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Kramer. It's uh, our honor to have you as our second uh, prize laureate, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, please stay tuned for the next event on 5 p.m., the lecture of Anat Admeti on uh, banking and inequality. We'd like to see you.